everyone. Thank you so much for coming along today. I'm really excited. We've got a really awesome panel here to grill. Um, we are waiting for one more person, Mickey Boardman, um, but he is stuck in traffic, but he will be with us shortly. So quickly, just to introduce you to everyone. First up, we have Liz Matthews on the end here, who is one of the best publicists in the business. Liz started out as a journalist, moving on to co-found Laundry Communications in 2002 and setting up her company, LMPR, in 2006. Liz works with lots of the most recognized faces in the business. Then next to Liz, we have Lisa, Lisa Gregg, who's Vice President of Marketing at American Express. Lisa leads the team that is responsible for shaping the company's international product line and communication strategy across 160 countries. Over her 20 years in the business, Lisa has helped American Express to forge long-standing alliances with the BFC and as a supporting partner of London Fashion Week. And next to Lisa, we have Angus. <laughs> who has headed the board, you headed the board at Elite Premier Model Agency, where he managed the careers of iconic models like Naomi Campbell, Claudia Schiffer, and Christy Turlington, eventually moving into casting and setting up his own company, AM Casting. And next to me on my left is Sarah Shotton, who's the clever force behind one of my favorite lingerie <laughs> brands, um, Agent Provocateur. Um, it says here that your belief that larger ladies should also be able to wear sexy undies has seen Agent Provocateur <laughs> expand uh, its ranges extensively. And then we have the lovely Stavros Karelis. Have I said that right? Uh, who's the founder and buying director of Machine A, which is the London-based boutique selling contemporary collections from a blend of emerging and established brands. And we're waiting on Mickey, who is one of the most recognized faces in New York, who is the editorial director and advice columnist at Paper Magazine. So he will, he's literally seconds away, apparently. <laughs> so we're just going to start by asking everyone to sort of go over exactly what it is you do on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. So can we start with you, Liz? Pick the wrong spot. I thought I was going to not oh, no, be sorry. in your <laughs> um, I am a publicist and agent. I look after people like Alexa Chung, Laura Bailey, Julia Retz and Rotfeld. Um, and we newly set up a brands division about two years ago. So we've just come from um, Orla Kylie's presentation, which maybe some of you were at. Uh, we are launching Emma Hill for Hill and Friends tomorrow. So Emma was the ex-creative uh, director at Mulberry um, and hasn't been seen for two years, been living in a cave somewhere and is very excitedly coming back to London Fashion Week tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's what I do. Thank you. Impressive. Thanks very much. Follow that. <laughs> that's, that's a tough act to follow. You're very competitive women so I'm probably the. <laughs> I'm probably the most unusual member of the panel because I'm not in a traditional role in fashion. But um, as Jade said, I'm with American Express, and I had the great pleasure of working with the amazing team that pulls together a lot of our experiences and support of the fashion industry. And um, part of what excites me about that is that I also have a passion for fashion and sort of grew up in that in, in fashion. And it's just one of those things where I get to get up every day and um, help support the industry with emerging talent. And we've done that over the last few years, uh, several years. And what people, uh, what many people don't know is that we actually helped to support Alexander McQueen and his first shows um, ever in New York and in Paris. So it's a great opportunity to be here and, and talk about fashion, which is one of the things I love. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wow, so that, those are two difficult acts to follow. Um, I don't really do very much apart from book models, really, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Like, um, I don't really know how to explain it any better than I work with some big brands. We work across um, you know, every platform of, of uh, the modeling business. So I, shows predominantly, but advertising, editorials. I'm the casting director over at ID Magazine. Um, and really, that's it. At the moment, you know, obviously, we're in the middle of the shows. This is our sort of busiest time. And um, we work with uh, designers in London, such as Preen, Erdem, Joseph, Ashley Williams, etc. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the creative director of Agent Provocateur. And um, I design lingerie. I also oversee all the um, campaigns and the whole creative side of the business and talk about bottoms and boobs all day. And it's quite <laughs> funny. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. 
Hello, hi, I'm Stavros. I'm the founder and buying director of Machine A Store, um, which is an independent store in Soho. We're working with emerging brands um, as well as very well established brands. Uh, we're scouting, we're finding new designers from shows, graduates, and we support them from the beginning of their career. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and now we have been in partnership with Show Studio as well. Nick Knight's an online platform, so we're working together um, to build um, the brand. Uh, from retail point of view, from an online point of view, uh, sales. So I'm also the bank director, so which means that I'm doing buying and I'm following all the shows. And um, yeah, that's my, my everyday activities about retail, basically. What does a brand have to do to, um, sorry, keep on you now, Stavros. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> oh, I'm really surprised. <laughs> what does a brand have to do to, to sort of appeal to you, do you think? Well, I mean, of course, you know, number one is uh, the talent. And I think, you know, this is the first thing that everyone sees into a young, especially a young designer and a young brand. But apart, apart from um, concentrating on the talent, which so many designers have, especially in London and in London Fashion Week, uh, something really, really important is that um, they know what means to be in retail. So they have to be sorted in terms of production. Uh, the pricing should be a good um, pricing and approachable. Uh, to all the stores, uh, they should know the competition. Being a designer nowadays is very, very challenging. I mean, it's easy in many, many different ways, but also it's very, very challenging in some other ways because you have to, um, the competition is massive, it's an international one. Um, you have to be good in sales, you have to be good in PR, you have to be good in promotion. Um, and there's so many people that they really, really want this to happen for them and very, very talented people. So to make the difference, and make a name for yourself, um, you have to have lots of things coming together. Um, but we are um, pleased enough to live in a, in, a, in a country and in a city in London that is called um, so, amaz <coughs> so amazing people and brands and designers. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. I'm hey, usually highly <laughs> professional. <laughs> <laughs> it's the traffic, not me. So, um, so I think it's it's a number of things that people have to have, but we are lucky enough in London because there are so many good designers based on the universities that we have in London, and they're coming every year. Um, and uh, we can see that for so many British designers that they're working for other big houses as well as they're working for themselves and make a big name and they're the strength to worldwide audience. And it's very nice to, to be to join us. Thanks Thank you. you know, My you pleasure. Running around. I saw you across the runway. I, I saw you. you. I thought that is that your daughter next to you? No, it wasn't. Actually. <clears throat> it was just My some random eight year old. My son is at home. <laughs> I just I, go, I like to pick up other people's children wherever possible. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, boy, that kid is the way. Anyway, great yeah, to see you. She it. was really gorgeous. I could have kept her. Anyway, um, I just, uh, everybody else has sort of briefly talked about what they do on a daily basis. And I did introduce, intro you without you without you being here. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of saying a little bit about what it is that you actually do. Well, I usually wake up in a panic, realize I'm late for where I'm going to go. Um, I'm Mickey Boardman. I'm the editorial director of Paper Magazine in New York. And... I'm also in charge of hiring stylists, photographers, and arranging photo shoots and things like that. And I just love fashion. So I sort of fell into it because I like it. I went to, I have a BA in Spanish from Purdue, which is very useful <laughs> and lucrative. But actually, it was a great experience to, to do that and live in Spain. But, and then I went to Parsons in New York City. I read about your infamous Jackie Ho collection. My Jackie Ho collection, which was Jackie Onassis hip hop inspired by that band Criss Cross, which you're all too young to remember. But they were these kids who wore their clothes backwards. So that I did an evening gown with like the backwards jeans on the bottom. And when I presented it, it was like crickets chirped. They were like, <laughs> security, get rid of him. But Parsons has actually changed a lot. And I think because of British schools like St. Martin's and Royal College of Art, who really encourage creativity and just have been churning out amazing designers for decades now. And in New York, we were, in my day, we were sort of trained to be, you know, Michael Kors' assistant. And I love Michael Kors, he's great, but it's like, you know. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> anyway, so, um, so yeah, so here I am, and I love London, I, and it's my tell favorite us about fashion London, week. London, because you're here for Fashion Week. I am. I love London in every way. I feel like people from London love New York, and people from New York love London. The grass is always greener. 
once I got over the f fact that of uh, being able to cross the street without getting run down because of the driving on the opposite side of the road, um, just the energy is amazing. And something that I think is amazing is that you said about the young designers, people like Astrid Anderson and Christopher Shannon and Bobby Abley, just a constant stream of people. And also from around the world, people like Marcos Alameda and Miyukinu, Mi Miyukinu, I don't even know how to say it, the two Indian sisters, the Rodarte of India, who are showing in London. So many people just come to London because it's a hub of creativity, and you have that, but then you also have Geeves and Hawks and Burberry. You have, to me, what I'm really interested in is the super new cool and the old rich heritage, and I'm not so interested in the middle, and what we've got a lot, a lot of in New York is the middle. I'm sorry, Kenneth Cole, but that's what we got. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think it's really great, and I think the BFC has been amazing, not to blow some smoke up the butt of our hosts, but you know, they bring press from around the world. They support the designers. And um, no other fashion week, I think, really does that. And it's really paid off a lot. And I think, it's, you know, London is the place that everyone wants to come. All the editors would rather come here than the other places. But the BFC has made it possible for them to come and, you know, made it easy for us to come. So I think that that's made a huge difference in the London fashion scene around the world. Fantastic. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about um, celebrities and how they play such a big part um, of a lot of the panel's lives up here. And I just wanted to ask you about how you feel about Monday Celebrity and their, their influence now on the fashion industry, because it's changed a lot. I mean, I started modeling over 20 years ago, and it's changed enormously since then. So what do you feel about that, Angus? Because, I mean, you obviously started out with all the supers, and um, how do you find your casting has, has sort of evolved? Um, it's good. I remember when you started, actually. Um, that makes me much older than you, which is a bit depressing. But uh, <laughs> basically, I think, I think, you know, then, back then, it was all about the models. It was all about, you know, it didn't really matter that every designer had the same lineup. Uh, but now, things have changed a lot, and there are so many new girls. And, you know, each season, we have to precast two days now just to wade through, um, for want of a better word, you know, hundreds of new girls. Yeah. There's an insatiable appetite for what's new. Um, and it's really, a, it's a completely different challenge. And so, you know, it isn't, it isn't about who you have in your show anymore. Um, there was a little bit of a throwback time when, you know, um, some of the sort of mid 90s, late 90s supermodels came back and did a few shows. But I think that was really the transitional period. And now we're very much, at this sort of, I, I always call it the BIC models, like the disposable model culture, where sadly, you know, these girls are scouted. Who do you think drives that? Do you think that's designers, or do you think um, that's the industry generally? No, I think in terms of the models, it's, it's, it's really, it is the designers. It's, it's that they want to differentiate themselves. I think that a lot of, you know, the big LVMHs of the world are buying up designers or working with designers. And I think that all of those brands feel very pressurized to differentiate themselves to other people under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of sort of muscle flexing between designers and it's actually quite, it gets quite brutal and sort of a little, um, a little silly. But, um, you know, on the other side of my business, on the sort of advertising side, we've seen just the most enormous uh, upturn in sort of using celebrities, using real people, using if you like, real celebrities. So like, you know, um, in, in New York, we have these incredible sort of, uh, well, I know you, you do in London as well, but we have so many restaurants, so many sort of celebrity chefs, if you like, not the, of the Jamie Oliver type, more, you know, sort of artisanal farm to table people. And, you know, we for Uniglo, we put them in the campaigns, you know, environmental campaigners, anything like that. There's a fascination for what's real. Um, and recently I started a new company, which is, um, basically a model agency for sports stars so because we've seen just you know what's more aspirational really than you know it's basically trying to knit the two fashion and sport together and what's more aspirational than somebody who's the best in the world at what they do but is also really good looking and can communicate a brand yeah and the doll looks pretty good with his top off and those ads <laughs> i mean i can't comment on that i mean just saying <laughs> Um, Liz, I think this is obviously a question for you as well, but because you work with celebrities on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, 
Where do you see their positioning now within all the brands that you work with and so on? I think the role of celebrities in fashion is hugely important and really kind of elevates, you know, combined with the press and, and the critics' reviews. I mean, talk about Alexa Chung, who I've worked with now for 11 years. You know, as somebody like that, who's really revered and has been heralded as a style icon by many journalists, can really break a brand. And, you know, there are loads of designers that won't come to the forefront because they'll run out of money. And if she, through her role at the BFC as ambassador for, for talent, can wear a designer like Issa Arfen and give her a platform um, and just shine a light and so that, that she's stocked somewhere. I mean, we've seen, we followed trajectories um, from Erdem, Christopher Kane, Simone Rocha, Amelia Wickstead. You know, these designers, I don't think would be, I think they're really grateful. I know they are. They tell me all the time when, you know, that girl wears a dress. It's like the Midas effect. I've never known anything like it. It's gone on for seven or eight or nine years, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. And I think she, she carries that role very responsibly and has fun with it as well, but really flies the flag for British designers, um, you know, represents them at the Met Ball and, and you know, and, and plays a really huge part. Yeah, and, and when you go about... Um finding uh, new uh, clients to represent like Alexa, what is it that you're sort of looking for? Because I imagine that you've got a sort of a long-term plan for most of the people you represent. Yeah, we normally have a relationship with casting directors or model agents and we listen to them about people. We don't scout people, but if they find someone that they're excited about and we see star quality, then, then we work with them. And we've kind of got, it's like supply and demand. We work with the right agents and the right people and, and trust their judgment in bringing people to us. And I think we've got a good track record um, editorially with editors taking chances. If we've consistently given them good people and good brands, they're going to take our advice. So, you know, it's incredibly important if you work with a young actress to get a, 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 you know, one of the big French fashion houses behind them. If Chanel addressing them, other brands will, will follow. There's a hierarchy. So, um, yeah, we work a lot with agents and they recommend people. Great. And also, Sarah, I know that you um, have just been working with Paloma Faith, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Who's a new face of um, Agent. Yeah. What's, what's it been like? What does it mean to work with uh, a singer like Paloma? I mean, we're known anyway for sort of using celebrities um, for our campaigns. Um, obviously, the, one of the most famous ones was Kylie Minogue um, when she was uh, obviously a musician at the time. And, and then we did obviously Kate Moss and... Maggie Gyllenhaal. So really for me, um, Paloma obviously wasn't an, an AP girl. Like I was an AP girl, you know. Um, she was with the brand about 14 years ago. And so we wanted to go back to the heritage. And, um, and uh, you know, a lot of AP girls have actually done very well and um, have their own business, they're on TV. And Paloma for me was the one that really had excelled. And um, obviously she's a very good friend and she loves the brand. And what we noticed as well when she was doing interviews on TV, she was always mentioning, you know, Agent Provocateur perfume and underwear. And we were like this, you know, she's perfect for us and had the right kind of energy. Um, so obviously it's done really well for us. And um, yeah, we, we love using celebrities. We would use more, but it's not that easy to get them to get their clothes off, basically. Yeah, <laughs> and true. also, they might get a bit, you know, <laughs> the other thing is, is, you know, there's they might not get a beauty contract if, right, they've, if they've done, done the lingerie. Sort of um, yeah, like the younger ones. I mean, I tend to prefer to use sort of um, girls that are a bit older and because, you know, they're a bit more comfortable in themselves in underwear. It's a, it's a big thing to get somebody to do an underwear ca uh, campaign, especially when it's agent provocateur and, you know, yeah. it's supposed to be the sexiest in the world. Well, it is, but, um, you know, and you're, uh, you know, it's a big, it's a big thing for them. Yeah. And Mickey, we're going to have to come over to you and talk about um, your break the internet shoot. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not so hard to get people to take their clothes off. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did you have to ask really nicely? I love celebrities. I do love all. I love super famous celebrities. The same with like the I like the young designers and the Tom Fords. I like this, the Alexa Chungs and the Miley Cyruses and the Kylie Minogues. I like the extremes. And the thing about you know people like Kim Kardashian is it's someone who everyone knows about or follows. And something that Alexa has in common with Kim, even though they're opposite extremes in a way, is their fans 
follow everything they do and if they wear it they want to buy it if they whatever they do the fans want to do and they're just these certain kinds of celebrities that I love that are really speak to millennials that you know are huge stars on the internet as opposed to someone like Nicole Kidman who's a huge star to us but no one on the internet cares about Nicole Kidman I'm sorry Nicole if you're out there today <laughs> She's fat, gorgeous, and fame, but like the kids on the internet don't care. But Alexa, they freak out if she does anything. And she actually, the thing I love about Alexa is the more we, she shot stuff for us and we've worked with her, and the more I know her, the more I love her and think her style's incredible, her ideas are incredible. It's real, it's like authentic, and I think that's amazing and to have those kinds of celebrities involved in fashion is great, like Victoria Beckham is another one who, like the cab driver was asking me about the Beckhams today for some, because my cab driver was saying how he thinks that Brooklyn is cute, but that the second son is actually the cutest. Is that Romeo or Cruz or, anyway. <laughs> but, um, and I think Even Victoria <laughs> also has amazing style and seeing her present her clothes, she really, you know, it just feels real. So I do think that celebrities are, like that are important now as opposed to a celebrity who's in, got a movie now and just shows up at a designer's show for money, who doesn't even know the designer, who has nothing to do with anything. That, to me, is boring and old. But it's new to have, like, so it's interesting to have celebrities that care about fashion and are interested in fashion and are real. And I think Kanye West fits in that mold. Um, uh, as, a, as a part, with your work with American Express and um, the BFC, you uh, sponsor and help promote a lot of the young, uh, brilliant talent that we have here in the UK. And I just wanted to ask, what, what are some of the most rewarding things about that? Who, who have you really enjoyed working with? Well, firstly, just helping them. I mean, these are the, the people, as we all know, who need the help the most. Um, we also work with larger brands as well, and I mentioned, I've mentioned a few of those earlier. Um, I mean, they all bring such an amazing talent. So we worked um, a few years ago with Jonathan Saunders. We've worked with Roxanda, um, most recently with Osman, and um, this year with Peter Pilato. And I think uh, I think what's great about working with them, and you know, some of the conversations that I've had with them is, um, and Stavros, I was really you're spot on in terms of what brands need to look for Thank you. Thank and how they um, Thank you. how they um, become successful. The other thing is because they're sort of starting in their careers, they're really finding out who they are. And one of the things that we help to um, support them through is bringing in our finance and our brand and communications teams to just help nurture them along. And one of the things I always reinforce is just be really clear who your customer is. Be really clear who, if it's a woman or a man, who's the design target? What do they look like? What, are, what music do they listen to? What consumes them? What, what um, uh, magazines do they read? Um, because it's really important because you can, early on in their career, they're really in, um, easily influenced. I'm sure you see this as well. And it's important to stay true to who you are and not lose sight of that. And you see, you know, sometimes, because they're so tempted, you know, early, you know, season after season to differentiate, but it's about also being true to who you're, who, who you are. Yeah, and I can see you nodding along there, Angus, because that must be true for a lot of your clients. Yeah, I think um, the younger the younger designers do get very very easily influenced, and um, I'm not really sort of backward at coming forward and and trying to help. You know, I think that um, through what I do. You know, we work with a young brand in Paris called Aganovic, um, one of the many shows that we do there, but that I've always wanted to be a part of their thing because they, it's so incredible and beautiful, but, um, you know, they really needed rescuing in terms of the casting and they, they needed it to be elevated. And I feel like you can, you know, you can really bring something, you can really translate to the people that are sitting front row, you can translate that, that brand and, and make it into something that is more legitimate for, for people who don't really know. I mean, there are many people here um, who I'm sure would sort of appreciate this particular designer's like, aesthetic, but they might not necessarily pay so much attention to it. And so, you know, we can, we can lend something to that. And I think, you know, um, a number of years ago, um, London was a sort of a little bit of a backwater in terms of the shows. You know, uh, back in your day, it was huge. We were the biggest city. And then there was, you know, there was a, a dead period. And then I had Simon and, and Caroline, everyone at the BFC, we used to sit together for hours, you know, um, trying to work out how to how to improve that because we had so much talent here and it needed to be showcased. Uh, in New York, you know, I, n I don't see anything new that's exciting ever. And um, 
I'm true. So happy to have been. A couple, a few little yeah, things. A couple, <laughs> very couple. Right, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I, I don't watch all this. why shows. I moved to London. Right. And I think, and, you know, and I think that that's, that's so exciting, being British and being based in New York, you know, it's so nice to be able to come back here and, and, um, and be part of this resurgence. Um, I think it's a really exciting time. I don't see any of the other cities comparing to London at the moment. They have their big houses, but they don't have any of the talent that we have. Yeah, that's interesting. And so what do you think, can I just ask you while we're on that, what do you think the major differences are? Because you've talked a little bit about New York. What do you think the main differences are in Milan and Paris, for example? Between Milan and Paris? Or yeah. um, hopefully no one will ever see this, but uh, you know, I think, there's, I think there are three shows that are worth three or four shows that are worth seeing in Milan, honestly. Like, and, and in Paris, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit sort of in the, in the midway between Milan and London. You know, there are exciting young designers that, we talk, that I just talked about and many others like that, like Jack and Miss, who we also work with. Um, and then the big, obviously, the, the big shows. I just, I wonder where the, where the culture comes from. I don't know how, how it is, but London has always had this. And you know, there was a mass sort of exodus of, of talent from London in this sort of dead period I was referring to. And that was very sad because the talent didn't, didn't go away. Um, but perhaps some people, you know, didn't, didn't get the, the support that they needed at yes, that time. Yes, I think that was a really big part of it, actually. So I always think it's really great to meet people like you, Lisa, who actually support um, our young designers, which means they can stay here. Because I remember there was a time when, you know, uh, a lot of half, I'd say, of our big designers were having to show abroad because the editors weren't coming. And I think it's a sort of mixture of all those things at once. So it's absolutely fantastic. And, and the way we think about it, I mean, these are the people that are going to be, you know, uh, in the vintage shops of the future. And um, it's so, ex I, and the bigger guys, certainly, we partner with them as well and we help them grow their businesses and just, you know, um, decide which locations they should open new shops and all that through our uh, insights and intelligence. But I think there's nothing like helping someone when they're just starting out and they really appreciate the help and, you know, we, we stay friends for, for a long time. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the work-life balance when you go into a creative industry. I'm sure a lot of you guys are either considering or you're already in the creative industry and wondering how uh, that sometimes works out. So I'm going to start with you, Liz, because so she's going to look at me. Liz has four children <laughs> and an incredible company. And um, I wonder how you manage as well, let alone everyone else. Wing it day to day. <laughs> I, I moved my mum to London when I had one child and one on the way. We were interviewing for nannies and she just kept sitting there drinking more and more red wine going, she's got terrible shoes on, she's going to murder your children. <laughs> I was like, why don't you do it then? She's like, I'd love to, thank you. And then, um, so she signed up for that and then I got drunk, got pregnant and had twins. I was like, there you go. Um, oh, I, they're now 10, 6 and 3 year old twins and I have... For the first, I mean, there's no s s formula, but I try and be 100% at work and 100% at home, which in crazy times like this is, I've checked into a hotel with my managing director who's sat over there. We're literally spooning in bed. It's so fun. <laughs> and um, we've left our husbands and children at home and we're playing dress up and we're there all the time for our clients and fittings and things early morning. And then I will go home and be a mum and have a few days of doing that. And... Um, I've never missed, uh, part of running your own company gives you freedom, so I've never missed um, sports days or birthdays. I just kind of work my schedule around it. I've got an amazing team um, who are always there to support if I can't go to shoots. I don't travel as much as I used to. I've got, Alexa's got a fantastic publicist in the States. Um, you know, we get the short straw because Bianca does New York and we do the rest of the world. Um, but we, I don't travel kind of anywhere near as much. And um, I don't know if you really want to make it work, you do. And I think that as much as this job is fantastic and enthralling, it's horrible sometimes and lonely and hard. And I go home to unconditional cuddles from, you know, a crazy three-year-old. And equally, Monday morning when, you know, I'm knee deep in nappies and vomit, I'm like, get me to Farringdon, please. <laughs> so. Yeah, they both boost each other. And Sarah, and Sarah also, you have uh, two small children, I believe. I do, yeah, I do. And um, actually, I had them quite late on. So um, I think for me, I, I was lucky enough to graduate and get the job at Agent Procter. And I've been there for 16 years, like I said before, I think. And um, 
you know, so it wasn't till two and a half years ago when I had George. So I'd, I kind of got to know my job. So I put a lot of time in at the beginning um, in my 20s and went out a lot and dated a lot of wrong men and did all those kind of things and worked very, very hard, like sometimes seven days a week, sometimes right through the night, put all the hours in and um, got to know the brand inside out. And I think when you know a brand really well and you know what you're doing and you're designing, it just comes very natural. So after I had George, I went back at six months and he was waking up every two hours through the night. I had my mum who was staying and my partner worked on the rig, so he would go away for two weeks at a time. So sometimes I was there, you know, not getting really much sleep and ending up in Agent Provocateur having to sort of lead the design team and do things. But because I knew it so well, I could do it half asleep, basically, because it was just something that I'd been doing for sort of so long. And I think, and also, like, Liz obviously loves her job, and I love being a mom, and I love my job as well. Um, you just get on with it, and you embrace it. And there's something, I don't know, you're like, yes, I've done it, I can do it. And it's um, it's very empowering you know, even when you're covered in baby vomit and puree, when something good happens at work, I don't know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. So don't ever think that you can't do both because you really, really can. And uh, determination is very powerful. When you're like, I'm going to do this, you can really do it. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Mickey, I'm not going to ask you about babies, <laughs> but I was just wondering, how did you start out um, with paper? And what would be your advice to sort of people that are, you know, interested in magazine? Well, um, as I mentioned, I was going to Parsons and not creating much of a splash, I'm afraid. A little bit, you know, here and there. But then I, paper was my favorite magazine. I'd always been addicted to magazines. I never thought you could even really have a job at a magazine. I didn't know anything. And I socially met um, someone whose best friend was the managing editor of paper and then met that person. And I said, oh my god, I love paper. You're so lucky to work there. And she said, well, what, we have interns. Why don't you come be an intern? And I know there's a lot of sort of scandal about unpaid internships in America, at least. I don't know if it's the same here. And my unpaid internship was the best thing that ever happened to me because I think it's sort of like, you know, it's like living, shacking up with someone before you get married or it's like a six month long audition. So I would, you know, on my days off from school, I would go to the office and, you know, whereas at school I was not getting much of an enthusiastic reception and I'm a Leo rising so I need a lot of attention and a lot of positive reinforcement even if I'm just doing the bare minimum and whereas then I'd go to the office and they'd be like we love your look we love oh you know and I was encouraged and it really felt like home and it felt like the place to be and I think as the girls said the ladies said you know when you're at when you love what you do and you're at a place that you really want to be I, I didn't care if I had to stay all night or go on some crazy errand, and there's a lot of cuckoo bananas stuff that we have to do, you know. But I loved doing it and was happy to be there. So somebody quit, and they asked me to answer the phones, for, and I happened to get kicked out of school because I failed a class my senior year. I don't know if I mentioned that. So I had one semester left and was asked kindly to leave. And they um, asked if I would answer the phones in the meantime until they figured out what to do. And that was 23 years ago. So and I'm still there. So I kind of learned on the job. And that's why the, the, the thing that upsets me about this people suing over these unpaid internships is if you don't want to do an unpaid internship, don't. Absolutely a 1,000%. And I do think it would be great if everyone could be paid. But you were, to me, the secret to success is to figure out where it is you really want to be and get yourself there. And once you're there, it's like a fairy tale just waiting for the happy ending to happen. You know what I mean? You can show them that you're amazing, show them that they need you, you know, and show that you should be there forever. And Thank you. And Stavros, I wanted to ask you as well a little bit about how you, how you ended up in your job, because I don't think we really went there. Well, I, um, about six years ago, uh, basically, I remember that I was going to all these shows from CSM and uh, Royal College of Arts and LCF, and I was seeing all these really amazing uh, graduate collections with graduates. And back then, it was when Astrid Addison was graduating. It was the beginning of Nazir Mashar. It was so many uh, siblings. It was really young designers that they were coming out at that time. Now, back then, it wasn't so many stores in London that they were supporting um, that young designers. I mean, it was really, really early stage of taking a graduate collection and putting it in a retail. So um, we start 
talking with some other people and we said let's create a space where actually we can sell these collections. Um, and I went to Astrid and I went to all these different people and I said would you be interested in putting straight up your graduate collections into a retail store and see how they start performing. It was a momentum, I think, in London that happened about six years ago that because I listened very, very carefully what all the rest of the people were saying about imagine designers. And um, it was a moment in London where about five years ago, um, it was a force altogether coming and supporting the emerging brands, the really young brands. It was a press, but also it was a retailers. And they were putting them in the windows, they're using the window spaces, they were selling the collections. And all this together, um, and also the, the celebrities that they were helping so much, and they still help so much, the press, everyone was like there. Um, and I think this is how it started. And Machine A was in the beginning of, of this whole kind of um, um, uh, interest of emerging brands, younger brands. So we started like that, and then we start uh, checking more and more shows, we're giving the space, but then I start working very, very closely with uh, all these designers in terms of production of the collections, uh, and um, we start like consulting them in many, many different ways, and of course it's super challenging. Lisa was absolutely right. In the beginning it's like so, so difficult for every designer to be able to launch um, their own brand. There's so many, many challenges, but if they're focused and if they got the help like American Express, for example, which is super important if someone offers this to them, you know, they will be able to, um, to, to do really well in their lives. And this is how we started with Machine A, and then later on we, um, some other people paid attention to what we do, like uh, Nick Knight and Show Studio, um, some other companies like um, Italian companies, different companies actually, that they start focusing in London on what we do with Imagine Brands, and um, we're expanding now as a retail. And, yeah. and what would be your advice to somebody who was thinking of a career as a buyer? for example. Okay. Well, um, as a buyer, it's it's basically the first and foremost thing. I know that everyone thinks that everything is about creativity and everything is about... Um, uh, but the main thing is the budget, basically the money. And it's, uh, about, money. you know, for good or bad, this is where we start as buyers. So you've got a budget, you, you've got your, you know which designers you want to go for. Um, and then you, uh, you approach them and you start basically trying like to get them for your store. Now, of course, there's, lots of competition around because you know we are so many stores we want like kind of like similar designers we want to support similar designers uh, but it's it's nice it's genuine it's it's something that progress and helps things um, a buyer is it's 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 a key person in every retail in, in every industry because they basically holding the money of you know of a retail store so this is where and for a designer also is super important um, what um, the relationship with the buyers is because this is where they're going to make eventually the money from. I mean, I know that press helps so much to that and everything else, but in the end of the day, they're producing collections to sell them and for the customers to buy and wear their clothes. So if, um, and this is the, the key element, and um, I think it's, it's, it's a very, very exciting job to do. And I think whoever wants to become a buyer is, um, is really, really nice because you get to meet so many designers, you get to think about different um, uh, different choices and the merchandising, the store and the visual merchandising. There's so many different teams that you have to talk with and to get where you want to get. Um, so it's it's really, really exciting, but in the end of the day, it's all about money, it's all about performances, it's a sales through, so fi the finances play a really, really big part into what we do as a work. Yeah. Thank you. And Sarah, I wanted to come to you as well because we're going to talk about with um, AP, for example. Mm. Um, you've been creative director there now for oh, five years. Five years. Probably How do you develop a brand that's got such great, uh, so recognised worldwide? What, what, how, how does that sit? I, mean, I imagine that's quite a difficult proposition. I mean, AP is, when I first started AP, we only had two stores and I worked with Joan Serena very closely actually. Um, and now we've got, I think about 110 or something worldwide. Um, and I mean, the brand has really evolved from when it first began. Um, and we've just had to try and sort of evolve ourselves, you know, and I always sort of, 
it's funny because we've kind of gone through peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs and we just um i don't know i mean like the collections are always the same collection goes worldwide we never design a collection for the different stores worldwide we just do with you know what what feels right um obviously now we are sort of global and it's becoming quite difficult when we're talking about you know celebrities that we use and stuff um you know we have to make sure that the celebrities that we use are sort of known worldwide um obviously paloma's only just starting to hit the us but the us is our biggest market now i would say um but uh, God, what else can i tell you about it i don't know we just uh, well, i mean it, it evolves all the time i mean yeah. it changes i don't know whether you've noticed um Obviously, uh, the founders who I worked with, Joe and Serena, it was a husband and wife team. And it was sort of, you know, I trained with them. So it was really good training for me because I got to know what a man liked and what a woman liked. How, how did you actually start with them? Um, I graduated from St. Martin's in the 90s. Um, I was you always been interested in lingerie, particularly, or was it just no, I totally, generally? totally fell into it. I was actually... Um, with um, Sarah from McQueen, Sarah Burton. Um, and um, we were all together with Warren Narona as well, who was also designing. And, um, you know, we came out of college and there wasn't really any jobs at that time. And um, I'd, you know, it's quite a full on college. So, I mean, it's brilliant, but you're just a bit like, I need a break, I need a break. And so there was a job just as office junior at Agent Provocateur. And, I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, my friends were like, you'd be brilliant there. You know, you wear a lot of Westwood. And, and it was very fun. It was a new brand and um, it had a good energy. And you know, it was qu quite underground at the time. And I started then, I literally did an apprenticeship, like you say. I mean, like Joe and Serena would be like, jump. And I'd be like, how high, you know? And they'd be like, go to Broadwick Street and do the, the windows. You need to change the windows. And I'd be like, I'm not, a vi I can't do windows. And they were like, yes, you can. Just get in the car and get over there. And I'd be like, uh, what am I going to do? And they'd be like, well, just make it up. And <laughs> so I'd do that. And then they ended up being in ID. And, you know, we were known for our windows. And there's a book about windows. But um, I literally did, like, you know, I find it really hard now to get um, the work experience girls to sort of, I don't know, there's not, my time it was like you were so pleased to have a job um, that you would literally do anything and you would work late. And it was great because you were, um, you became part of the family and, you know, you would be working really hard, but also you'd be all going out for dinner and then you'd end up going to a great party and then you'd maybe get in at five in the morning and be like, oh, and then you'd be like, quick, brush my teeth and get back to work. And, it, and it, I don't know, it's really fun. And, and I literally just did bits of everything. And, and what I didn't realise was that I was basically... Um, you know, I'd do the windows, I'd do the interior stuff, because it'd be like, we're opening a store in LA, you've got to do the interiors. And then I was designing stuff. And I kind of, I don't know, I just, when, when it came to five years ago when Joe left, they were like, you've been doing this for ages, so we know you can do the job, because we've been what, you know, the people who own AP now, there's quite a few people, but they were like, been watching what you've been doing, and that's how it all came about. Amazing. Yeah, so, that. but it's mm -hmm. sort of, cha it has changed, obviously, yeah. um, but it's very, it's an exciting brand. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And Angus. I'm coming. <laughs> Hi, Angus. Take, take your time. Sorry, you know. Um, I've got to ask you a few questions about the supers. Um, because it was just such a mad time, wasn't it? And um, can you just tell me a little bit about what it was like booking those girls back then? Or not really. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah. Uh, um... It was a lot of fun, actually. It was, it was, like I said, it was a really fun time. It was sort of, it's a lot more fun than it is now, put it that way. But um, I suppose I'm on the other side of the casting couch, as it were. Um, but uh, yeah, they were, they were not easy. I mean, you were not easy. I remember that as well. I mean, I, how dare you? <laughs> Outrage. Um, but yes, yeah, certain times I'd have, yeah, sort of have to go and prize people out of bed. Um, three hours after they're meant to be somewhere. And uh, so basically you get abuse from everybody. You um, survived, Angus. You I got through it, <laughs> <laughs> muddled through, yeah. Do you much prefer being on the other side now and being... Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like everybody else was saying about internship, I feel like my apprenticeship to do what I do now is working in a model agency. 
Um, it's brutal, it's really hard, um, really long hours, very little pay. Um, How did you get started there? Um, I actually had no job and I was um, going out with someone who was doing the, that job and she used to come home with her new faces pictures and I used to say, oh, this one's good, this one's not so good, you should, you know, you should start her. Um, and she said, you're really good at this, you should, you should, I heard of a job going, so I went, I went for that job and, you know, that was that. Amazing. And it's, so we talked a lot about how different it is then and now. Um, but the car on with with castings, for example, what what is it that you are particularly looking for? I know that you said you're looking for a new face, but there's got to be more than just a new face when you're casting. Y yeah, I mean, you have to put the the hat on of the designer that you're with at the time. I mean, we work with Rick Owens, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with what we do there, um, which is sort of um, probably one of the most fun things we do. And and um, and then you know you. In the same day, you might be going to uh, I don't know to Kenzo, where you're doing you know the peoples of the world, you know, and uh, and, uh, and sort of luxury beauty. So it's that's the challenge really is sort of getting in a car, clearing your mind of what you've just done, and going to the next place and sort of looking at the collection, working with the designer and the stylist, and and trying to see, trying to envisage what the woman is or man, and. Um, and then try and translate that into a cohesive picture via the, via the casting. Because so many people that do my job, I think just try and get the best, you know, the most famous models into their shows. Or, you know, at the, t at, at the moment that is, as I said, they have a short shelf life, but um, it's all about who you have in your show and not about what it actually looks like. And I think, you know, it's really important. It drives me crazy as I look back over, which I do do, um, by the way, when I look through my shows at the end of the season and I see Duff, choices that I've made or like something that, that I allowed the designer to, to make a decision on that I knew was wrong and invariably they're like, you were right, we shouldn't have done that, but then they do it again the next season. But you know, <laughs> it's just the way of the world. But you know, I think, I think that's the thing. It's, 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 it's not really about looking for something in general, it's about putting yourself, immersing yourself in the brand for however long you're with them. Do you think that's something you can learn or do you think you have to be intrinsically good at it? I mean, if there's people out here that might be interested in going into casting. Um, well, there are very successful casting directors that don't have a good eye. So, um, and again, naming no names. But, um, but I, think, I think you've got, you've got a, I think there's a mixture, really. I think it's a time management thing. My business partner is extremely good at managing of time and charts. And I mean, there's so many models and... You've got to be very organized, um, for sure. Otherwise, you'll miss people. And, and, and that's definitely a big part of the job. I'm super disorganized, but I have a great team who are sitting over there. And they, uh, and they make, you know, I, I text them every morning saying, where am I going? And they say, just look in the command book that we have for London. And I go, I, I, I can't find it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but then when I get there, you know, hopefully if I do get there, um, I, feel, I do feel like I can make things happen that not many other people can. Okay, well, I just want to say thank you very much to all of you. Um, I found that really interesting, and I hope you did too. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let's hear it. And let's hear it for Jade. What a one! You did a wonderful job moderating. <laughs>